This week, we are going to look at Westward Expansion, A Century of Dishonor, which is based off of your reading for this week, The American Yop, Chapter 17. The term A Century of Dishonor was coined by Helen Hunt Jackson, who was an American author, and you'll read a little bit more about that in one of your primary sources for this week. Helen Hunt Jackson coined this era as a century of dishonor because of the way that Native Americans were treated. And we're going to look at that a little bit more throughout this lecture. So here's a painting of post-Civil War westward migration by John Gass, and it's known as American Progress. It was painted in 1872. So here we see Progress as a woman dressed in white, leading settlers from the east to the west. She's leading them from the east, which you can see is, is really well lit, seems pretty safe, to the west where it's dark, unwelcoming, because they're not really sure what to expect. You see her holding a telegraph wire in one hand and a school book in the other, and this is just to show what they plan on doing when they move out west. They're, they're bringing these technological advances of like the telegraph, and then they also plan on educating the native peoples who live there and building schools. Okay, so this is showing the movement from the east to the west. So important thesis of this time is the Turner thesis. And the Turner thesis was created by Frederick Jackson Turner in 1893. And this is kind of a new way just to look at history um, so Turner looked back at the historical changes in the West and saw different waves of civilization that washed across the continent. He believed that Americans had been forced by necessity to build kind of a rough civilization out of the frontier. Okay, they were trying to survive, so that's why they moved out West. He argued that the work of ordinary people deserved the same study as that of great statesmen. And this is pretty revolutionary for this time because before how history was studied was you looked at the great men. So during this time period, you would look at people like J.P. Morgan or Pullman and look at their contributions to society. But he was suggesting that oftentimes ordinary people had just as much impact as these great men and they deserved just as much to be studied as the prominent figures of a certain period of time. So one of the major reasons that a lot of people moved out west was to, for economic reasons, was to gain money. And one of the, what they felt like was perhaps maybe the easiest way was looking for gold. So a significant portion of the mining workforce were single men without families. And this makes sense because if you're, uprooting your life and you're moving out west and you may or may not get rich you don't really want to move a whole family out there because if you move and you don't get rich you kind of moved your family out there for no reason so it makes a lot of sense that single men were doing this without families um, working class women also moved out west, and they worked in places like shops, saloons, boarding houses, and brothels. So we had a lot of migrants moving to the west during this period, looking to get rich. And out of these migrants who settled in the Rocky Mountains, they were more valuable to the region's development than the gold that they found. And this is partially because they're moving out west, they're starting to work the land, they're starting to kind of build towns, they're starting to bring a little bit of civilization to the west, to these areas that may not have been inhabited be before they moved out there. Another way that people earned money during this time was by bison herding. So on the right, you see this picture of two bison herders with a mountain of bison skulls. Bison skulls were often used, they were ground down and used as fertilizer. So bison were really important during this time period because there were so many of them and they were fairly easy to kill. And they were worth a lot of money because you could use several parts of the bison and 
sell them for some type of money. Okay, so for example, leather from bison, from the hides of bison, um, supplied industrial belting in Eastern factories. Um, a lot of bison during this time period were slaughtered and the peak was in the early 1870s because you could use their hide, you could use their skulls, you could also use their meat. There were several different aspects of the bison that you could use. So expansion of railroads replaced bison with cattle. And part of the reason why this happened was because bison were so overhunted that there started to become so few of them that they weren't really used anymore for economic gain. Okay, because they had overhunted them um, and there weren't that many left. So an important group of people during this time who moved out west were the Mormons. So on the left is a picture of Joseph Smith. He is often considered, or he is considered, the founder of the Mormon church. Um, he was born in 1805, and he was the first president of the Church of Christ. Mormons are different from other groups of Christians because they accept extra books into their teachings. So for example, the, one of the major books in Mormonism is the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon contains writings of ancient prophets who lived on the American continent from 600 BC to 421 AD. Joseph Smith, when he was 17, claimed that an angel of God appeared to him and told him that a collection of ancient writings was buried in a nearby hill. And this was in modern day New York. So the angel of God told him that he wasn't allowed to take the writings just yet, but he had to come back on the same day the following year. So after four years of doing this, of coming back to the same place, talking with this angel of God, he was allowed to take the plates and he was told to translate them into English. So Mormons were also, also known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they were fleeing from religious persecution. So this is a prevalent theme throughout history is that a lot of religious groups feel like they're being persecuted, that they're not accepted. So they move to either different parts of a country or they move to a different country overall. So that way they can freely practice their religion. Part of the reason why they felt religious persecution was because many Americans were suspicious of the Latter-day Saint movement and its unusual rituals. So one of these rituals which people viewed as strange at the time is that Mormons are polygamous, meaning that they have multiple wives. So that's, a, that's something that some Mormons still practice today. And back then in the 1800s, a lot of Americans didn't necessarily like that aspect of Mormonism. So it kind of forced Mormons to move out west. After Joseph Smith died, Brigham Young is generally considered the person who led the church after the death of Joseph Smith. So he encouraged Mormon residents of the territory to engage in agricultural pursuits, which is important because it allows them to be self-sustaining, work the land, get their own food. He also warned Mormon residents to be cautious of outsiders, which during this time, it makes sense because like we just talked about, a lot of people were suspicious of the Mormons. So he just wanted the Mormons to kind of be cautious of people, of outsiders, because they may not they may be mean and not treat the Mormons in the best way. So Brigham Young was born in 1801 in Vermont, and he was an American religious leader and politician. He founded Salt Lake City, which is in Utah, and he served as the first governor of the Utah Territory. Okay, so next we're going to look at the Homestead Act, which is another major reason why we see this shift of people moving to the West. In the decades after the Civil War, thousands of farmers moved West into the Great Plains, taking advantage of the cheap land provided by the Homestead Act. 
The act was signed by Abraham Lincoln in 1862 to encourage Western migration. Under the act, settlers could receive title to 160 acres of Western land if they were at least 21 years old, if they built a house at least 12 by 14 feet in size, and if they worked their land for five years. The way the Homestead Act worked, you would go out to the land office in whatever region that you were planning to settle in, and you would pick your plot of land, and you would build your house, and you would begin to do uh, the things that you needed to do to meet the criteria set up by the federal government. By 1900, claims for over 80 million acres had been filed, creating more than 372,000 farms. There were many people who benefited incredibly, who would never have had the access to land if they hadn't bid for the Homestead Act. But besides simply owning land, Western farmers had to survive the harsh conditions on the Great Plains in order to succeed. Many soon saw their dreams dashed. Decades of drought ravaged small farms. Prices for crops fell as mechanized corporate farms arose. Railroads imposed steep rates to transport their goods or refused to serve rural areas altogether. When small farmers complained, railroad baron William Vanderbilt uttered his famous line, the public be damned. Many farmers took on back-breaking debt in order to keep their farms. Eventually, they banded together, forming cooperatives that gave them the economic and political strength to survive. Okay, now we're going to look at the, the Indian Wars and federal peace policies. So as some Americans start migrating out west, we know that there are already Native peoples who live in these areas. So that's obviously going to create some type of tension, and a lot of times it led to wars. So the Dakota War, which happened from August 17th to December 26th, 1862, was also known as the Sioux Uprising. Now this was an armed conflict between the U.S. and several bands of eastern Dakota known as the Santee Sioux. And this occurred in Minnesota, and this was a victory for the United States. Shortly after the Dakota War, we have the Sand Creek Massacre. Now, this occurred November 29th, 1864. This is a massacre of Cheyenne and Arapaho people by the U.S. Army in the American Indian Wars. Now, with the Sand Creek Massacre, a 675-man force of the 3rd Colorado Cavalry under the command of John Shivington attacked the Native Americans in the southeastern Colorado Territory. Now, records differ on how many people were actually killed, but it ranges from anywhere between 69 to 600. Because of these massacres and because of these wars, they tried to establish the Indian Peace Commission, which was a group formed by an act of Congress on July 20th, 1867. And the whole purpose of this commission was to establish peace with hostile Indian tribes. Treaties were designed to move the tribes to reservations and to try to assimilate the native peoples. So Native American assimilation, and this is a pretty telling picture of how assimilation worked. So here we have a Native American man, Tom Torlino, who is part of the Navajo Nation. He entered this Carlisle Indian School in 1882, which was a boarding school which was used to assimilate Native Americans into the American way of life. So he entered the school in 1882, which is when this picture on the left was first taken. He left the school in 1886, and here we see on the right is a picture from a year before he left in 1885. So this is only a three-year difference, but we can see how much he has changed. Okay. He, his hair is cut, he's no longer has his He's no longer wearing earrings or any type of jewelry. His dress has changed. And honestly, his skin even looks a little bit lighter. So Native Americans versus the United States military. So look at the Southern Plains versus the Northern Plains. 
In the Southern Plains, we have the Red River War. So this was a military campaign launched by the army in 1874 with the purpose of displacing Native American tribes from the Southern Plains and trying to relocate them to reservations in the Indian Territory. So in the Southern Plains, we basically have the United States Army just trying to remove Native Americans from their own land. In the Northern Plains, we have the Treaty of 1868. So the U.S. recognized the Black Hills as part of the Great Sioux Reservation set aside for exclusive use by the Sioux people. So that was a pretty great thing in the Treaty of 1868, at least at first, because a lot during this period, a lot of Native Americans, their land was taken away from them and they were forced to assimilate. But the Treaty of 1868 recognized that they should have land set aside specifically for Native Americans. However, General Custer led an expedition with miners who were seeking gold into the Black Hills. And that's where we get the Battle of the Little Bighorn. It's one of the most crushing defeats in American history. Custer's last stand. June 25th, 1876. Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer and over 600 troopers of the 7th United States Cavalry arrive in the Little Bighorn Valley of Southern Montana. The cavalry has come to subdue a village of defiant Indians. Thousands of Sioux and Cheyenne under the leadership of the great holy man, Sitting Bull. For a century, the United States has pushed the frontier west, herding tribe after tribe onto agencies or reservations. The Sioux and the Cheyenne don't want to give up their land on the northern plains. These last defiant Indians gather into a colossal wandering village. In the spring of 1876, the village arrives on the plains of Montana. The village was always on the move. They knew the army was out after them. And to the United States Army, to capture a fleeing village was an impossible task. Custer follows Sitting Bull's path west across the Wolf Mountains. On the other side, the Indian village stands on the banks of a slender river. The Indians call it the Greasy Grass. The army calls it the Little Bighorn. On the morning of June 25th, Custer and his troops arrive in a treacherous landscape carved up into hidden channels and ravines. Perfect cover for fighters who know its contours deadly for the soldiers who don't. Around noon, Custer makes what many believe is his fatal mistake. He divides his forces into three separate columns. Custer heads up the bluffs along the river to attack from the north. It's his first clear look at the size of the village. He realizes he doesn't have enough troops to do the job. He sends a rider south with a note calling for more men and more ammo. It's important to keep in mind that no one had any idea of how many Indians there would be. They simply had no idea. Indians are surrounding Colonel George Armstrong Custer and his battalion. Survivors are struggling to join up with other troopers on nearby high ground. A spot now called Last Stand Hill. The tables are turning for Custer. He's no longer the attacker. He's being attacked. The size to take this high hill, which we call Last Stand Hill today. All the soldiers killed their horses to hide behind. All the warriors said was they got close to this hill, they arched their arrows high into the sky, having those arrows come down behind those dead horses. They said, we rained arrows down on those men. Their shots quit coming, and we rushed up and we killed them all. Lieutenant Colonel George Custer and over 200 of his men annihilated in a defeat that devastated America in 1876. This battle, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, was the Plains Indians' greatest victory. This caused the government to send out more forces, more military. Less than a year after the battle, Sitting Bull flees to Canada, and Crazy Horse surrenders in Nebraska. 
The last stand has been studied more closely than almost any military engagement in our history. Today, the battlefield still lies serene and empty above the cottonwood trees lining the Little Bighorn River. USS Enterprise had proven her steel. Okay, so now we have Generals James Carlton and William Tecumse Sherman. So they had different ideas about what to do with the Native American peoples. So we see that General James Carlton, he was very for moving the Native Americans to reservations because he believed that the Native Americans were kind of hindering westward expansion. So he moved them to these reservations and they had really poor conditions. There were food rations and be, or they weren't getting their food rations and they ended up starving because of it. Okay. Um, so conditions were very horrible. Now we see Sherman. So he wrote, he went to these reservations and he wrote of the inhumane conditions for the Navajos and he recommended that they be returned to their homeland in the West. So Mexican Americans and Westward Expansion. So we have the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and this treaty was put into place after the Mexican-American War. So because of this treaty, Mexico gave some of its land to the United States and our the land area of the United States grew. We were able to have land which is now in modern day Arizona, California, New Mexico, Texas, Colorado, Nevada, and Utah. So we have a lot of um, Mexican-Americans, they migrated out to California and there was this group called the White Caps. So the White Caps was a vigilante group and they were a group active in the New Mexico territory in response to Anglo-American squatters. So this land was their land, but Americans were coming in and trying to claim that it was theirs. And they did this through squatting, through basically just sitting in the land um, and saying that they owned it. So they use intimidation and raids to try to force these people out of this land. And the name, the white caps, comes from the white head coverings that many of them wore. Okay, so we have Sunday laws. So Sunday laws, and there are still some Sunday laws that are in effect around the country, but Sunday laws were put into place partially as a way to restrict Mexican Americans and what they did, but Sunday laws are used to restrict or ban certain activities on Sunday for mostly religious reasons to try to promote Sundays as a day of worship. They also had greaser laws. So greaser laws were enacted in 1855 in California, and they legalized the arrest of those perceived as violating its anti-vagrancy statute. So during this time, it was, they had anti-vagrancy statutes, which were used to try to kind of take away or limit how many homeless people were living in the state of California. So this greaser, these greaser laws were used to prevent homeless, an excess of homeless people in California. And then the barrios were clusters of working class homes in which many Mexican Americans lived. It's okay, so a westward economic expansion, looking at railroads specifically so this is an example of the of a railroad map. Um, this is mostly of the, I mean, it's pretty close in, but we see we have Ohio and Illinois, Michigan. So what the railroads kind of look like in the northern United States. 
Okay, so watch a short video on the Transcontinental Railroad. So transcontinental means that this railroad was meant to stretch from one side of the United States to the other. Making tracks. In the 1850s, the fastest way to travel over land was by train. But at the time, railroad lines didn't extend all the way across the United States. Pioneers trying to reach the West had to survive a difficult journey by wagon that could take six months. To unite the country by rail, President Abraham Lincoln granted two companies the opportunity of a lifetime to build the first transcontinental railroad. The Union Pacific Railroad would start from Nebraska and the Central Pacific from California. The two lines would eventually meet in the middle. The companies were promised huge plots of land and thousands of dollars for each mile of track they laid. The race was on to make a fortune. Starting in Sacramento, California, the Central Pacific Railroad faced an enormous hurdle. Its track had to pass through the towering Sierra Nevada mountain range. The mountains posed a great challenge for engineers, but it wasn't the engineers who were laying the track. Laborers from Ireland and China did most of the hard work for low pay. They faced harsh conditions, blasting through mountains and tunneling through rocky terrain. In the east, the Union Pacific Railroad workers were rushing ahead on the flat plains. But their path was intruding on other people's land. This was home to the Cheyenne, Sioux, Arapaho, and many other American Indian tribes. To conquer the western frontier, the United States government forced American Indians off their land. And the buffalo that Native Americans depended on for food, clothing, and shelter were being hunted to extinction by the newcomers. For Native Americans, the railroad didn't represent progress. It meant the destruction of their way of life. Many tried to halt the railroad's construction, but their resistance couldn't stop America's westward expansion. The push was on. The meeting point for the two railroads was set in Promontory Summit, Utah. As the railroads drew closer, laborers were pushed to work faster. Even more money was now being awarded for each mile of completed track. Setting a historic record, Chinese workers laid 10 miles of track in a single day. It was their speed that propelled the Central Pacific to reach the finish line first. On May 10, 1869, the final golden spike was hammered into the track, completing the world's first transcontinental railroad. A journey across the country that had taken six months by wagon can now be made in seven days. And along the route, thousands of acres of land were open to settlers who would forever change the American West. Okay, so because of the Transcontinental Railroad, it made it easier to travel out west because, mostly because it was just a lot faster. Okay. So we have the 1862 Pacific Railroad Act. So this became law on July 1st, and this allowed America to construct a transcontinental railroad, so a railroad which would connect the east to the west, through the through issuing government bonds and grants of land to railroad companies. So railroads created enormous labor demands. So that's one of the good things about the creation of the transcontinental railroad was that it did create a lot of jobs. So by 1880, approximately 400,000 men or nearly 2.5% of the of the nation's entire workforce labored in the railroad industry. 
Okay, so government incentives were offered for men who are willing to contribute to the development of the nation's first continental rail line. And we kind of see this really culminate with the, with the world's Columbian Exposition. So here is a picture of the world's Columbian Exposition. And this occurred in 1893. And it was the anniversary of Columbus's arrival to the New World. Um, so the 400 year anniversary and the Columbian Exposition had over 27 million visitors. And part of the reason why it had so many visitors is because of this transcontinental railroad. So people from all over the country were able to visit this Columbian Exposition, which took place in Chicago, Illinois. Okay, so now looking at cattle. So this is a picture of a cattle roundup in Colorado. So cattle drives. The Chisholm Trail was very important because it was used to move cattle from ranches in Texas to Kansas. So eventually the Chisholm Trail would stretch over 800 miles, which is a pretty large amount of land. Historians estimate that the number of men who worked as cowboys in the late, okay. historians estimate the number of men who worked as cowboys in the late 19th century to be, to be between 12,000 and 40,000. So once again, through these cattle drives, we see a lot of jobs being created. So a very important person in that worked in cattle drives was Molly Dyer Goodnight. Her name was actually Mary, but she went by Molly. Um, she was born in Tennessee in 1839, and she was an American cattlewoman and rancher. She was a 90, 1991 inductee to the National Cowgirl Museum and Hall of Fame. And this is where we kind of see women starting to take on these roles that we wouldn't necessarily identify as jobs for women. Okay, so it was pretty rare. It, pre, it was pretty rare for a woman to be in, this involved in the cattle drives. Um, railroad lines pushed into Texas and made the great drives obsolete. So with the creation of the railroads, it kind of lessened the impact of the cattle drives and the necessity of them. So the Dawes, Dawes General Allot, Allotment Act was passed by Congress on February 8th, 1887. So this splintered Native American reservations into individual family homesteads and single individuals over 18 would receive an 80 acre allotment and orphan children received 40 acres. Lands that remained unclaimed by tribal members after allotment would revert to federal control and be sold to American settlers. Okay, so this was kind of another injustice that was put upon the Native American people because it took apart their reservations um, and any that were unclaimed were sold to American settlers. So the aftermath of the Dawes Act. Americans viewed, Americans viewed the Dawes Act as an uplifting humanitarian reform, but Native Americans didn't view it like that. So shortly after this, the Native Americans started practicing the spiritual movement known as the ghost dance. And this was a practice of a dance that would reunite the light, that would reunite the living with the spirits of the dead and end westward expansion. Because at this point, Native Americans were kind of over the fact that their lands were constantly getting taken away from them and all of the massacres that were occurring against the Native American peoples. They also believed that the ghost dance would bring peace and unity to the Native American peoples. So the Lakota and South Dakota um, were kind of subjected to the Dawes Act. White homesteaders began to take their land. And as a result, they suffered from starvation um, they weren't given enough food, and they, ref they feared a future as landless subjects 
So they sent a delegation of 11 men, and they joined Ghost Dance Pilgrims in their move westward to Nevada, and eventually returned the spread of this Ghost Dance revival in the Dakotas. And then we have the Wounded Knee Massacre. So this occurred on December 29th, 1890, and this marked the end of armed Native American resistance on the plains. So at this point, honestly, the Native Americans were kind of defeated. They, in a sense, started to give up a little bit because they were put down so much by these laws and by these acts that were enacted by the American government, which, and, which resulted in them getting their land taken away um, and then not really having a place to live. Okay, so here's a picture of the Wounded Knee Massacre. So you see a lot of bodies, dead bodies, that are put into this trench. So we have rodeos, Wild West shows, and the mythic, American West, and Calamity Jane. So Calamity Jane was born on May 1st, 1852 in Missouri. Her real name is Martha Jane Canary, but she went by Calamity Jane. Okay, so she was a frontiersman and sharpshooter. Um, and she appeared in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, which we'll look at a little bit on the next slide. I don't know why it's not letting me take this. Okay. Social media. Um, yeah, so now we see this role of women definitely starting to shift a little bit more because now we're starting to see women participate in these roles when we look at Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. So Buffalo Bill's Wild West show was created by William F. Cody, and he named himself Buffalo Bill. Um, and these, this show allowed Americans to catch a glimpse of the American West. Because at this point, I mean, like you could go out on the transcontinental railroad, but not everyone was able to do that. So not everyone was able to understand what life was like out in the West. So Buffalo Bill brought these shows to people to kind of show them what life looked like. So, so we also have women like Annie Oakley and May Manning Lily, who are very similar to Calamity Jane. Both of these women um, were also sharpshooters. Uh, Manny Mae Lily was also an equestrian, so she often would use her gun or like shoot at targets on top of a horse while she was riding a horse. Um, but both these women, along with Calamity Jane, kind of show this transition of women into what was considered more masculine roles. Because it wasn't very popular at this time for women to go out and participate in these type of shows or to even really identify as frontiersmen or sharpshooters and to show their talent to two people in like Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Okay, so this is an example of what the Wild West looked like on film. <laughs> 
just stop it there. So criticisms of the Turner thesis. So like we talked about in the beginning, the Turner thesis, one of the main parts of it was that Turner was beginning to look at these different waves of civilization that were moving out to the West and also identifying the role that individual people played as opposed to looking at these larger, greater men of history. So some criticisms of the Turner thesis is that by focusing his analysis on people in the periphery or people off to the side, Turner D emphasized the role of pretty much everyone else. So when you're looking at studying history and looking at the impacts that people have, you have to look at different groups of people. And by just looking at one group of people, just looking at like ordinary people, he left out all the other groups of people that had an impact on this time period and the migration out west. And so many people who lived on the frontier were not part of his thesis because they did not fit his model of democratizing America. So this also fits along with the first point of he just left out a bunch of people, like a bunch of different groups, because they didn't fit his overall thesis. Um, the thesis showed the thesis slowed continued academic interest in the field. So part of the reason why this thesis slowed academic interest in the field is because once again, the whole issue is that he's not looking at every group of people. He's focusing on the people who he wants to focus on. And by doing that, a lot of people's involvements and the roles that they played and how they contribute to this time period are kind of left out. So those are some criticisms of the Turner thesis okay, is that he tended to leave people out and not analyze and look at um, different groups of people. So different races or people of different wealth statuses. And so that's it for this lecture. Next week, we are going to look at life in industrial America.